have two. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Daniel and Roger, so thank you very much for your uh, wonderful papers, which uh, I intersected a little bit. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased that they went in uh, so many diverse and interesting directions. Um, the first question I have actually does uh, address both of your uh, sets of remarks, and it's, it's very simple, and then it's going to be followed by another very simple question. Uh, the first is, what does it mean? Uh, this is primarily for Rogers, actually, but it also came up in, the, in Daniel's final remarks. What does it mean for any political idea to be analytically distinct? And if you can answer that question, what justifies that distinctiveness? And the more, uh, this relates to, obviously, liberalism, and, or rights and racism, liberalism, and inequality. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of Daniel's remarks, it relates to the idea of the distinction between the political and the social. I mean, what, what grounds it? Why should we respect it? What substance does, do these distinctions have? And the second issue it relates to uh, more to what um, Rogers was, uh, was saying, but also in terms of the political agenda that Daniel might have. And it has to do with dealing with racial inequality in the United States and the problems that we're finding nowadays in addressing it. Um, the problem of, of your, you were saying at the end of the problem had to do with the way in which individual rights had been kind of expropriated by uh, those who were um, not very much interested in addressing the question of racial inequality. But there is, it seems to me, an issue nowadays of identifying and here I'm going to be talking about practically, uh, the distinctive character of racial injustice vis-a-vis -vis other kinds of injustice. We know uh, sort of morally what it involves in terms of its history, etc. But how does it factor into a political program? And uh, this also, I thought, would relate to questions of immigration. I mean, if the question of illegal immigrants is one that's deeply troubling given the fact that we have been, uh, we, the United States, has been a cause of a great deal of the illegal immigration which it then proceeds to punish. But besides feeling bad about it and feeling that we have a moral obligation to care for the illegal immigrants, how do we address its unique political character in a program that is about um, remediating injustice. Um, well, before I turn to John, I just want to say in uh, uh, response to uh, Danielle's comments that um, uh, I do very much uh, see a connection with what I was arguing, and I, I think that um, uh, I'm in sympathy uh, with both your uh, points that um, I think uh, uh, it is true uh, in the first place uh, that it is a mistake to um, analyze the uh, contestation uh, as if we had a unitary uh, political system or state uh, structure, uh, uh, that we have a more complex society that you're uh, capturing on these um, uh, distinct loops. Um, and that uh, within state structures, there are different institutions that can be serving different purposes. And some of the work um, that I've done with Desmond King, where we're mapping opposing racial alliances, we're trying to show how there are different groups and different um, institutions on different sides of major racial uh, issues. And uh, your comments suggest a further uh, elaboration. Uh, and your point concerning the social, I think um, uh, it is true and probably even more appropriate for the central theme of this uh, uh, seminar uh, that um, the um, uh, if you allow people uh, the freedom to uh, develop uh, their own associations and uh, conceptions of identity, uh, you are going to generate difference, and then you are going to face the problem of how you how far you recognize and accommodate um, uh, difference. Uh, 
while at the same time uh, trying to have meaningful equality for all. There's a tension there. And in some of my most recent work, I'm arguing that, in fact, that's uh, the central tension for um, uh, citizenship in the 21st century. Um, so I really am in sympathy with both those uh, uh, points. Uh, in terms of uh, John's two questions, um, what does it mean uh, for, an, for our ideas to be analytically distinct? It means, I have a simple answer, uh, it means they're not the same idea. Uh, uh, it means uh, that um, uh, there is a uh, difference between them that means that their contents are distinguishable and uh, perhaps um, uh, in important ways opposed. Um, and uh, the uh, argument has been uh, that um, uh, liberal doctrines of rights, rights are fundamentally uh, the same as uh, doctrines of racial inequality put in the strongest form. And that is, it's only that very strong form that I've objected to it. I've said uh, they're intertwined, but they're not the same. And nothing more than that. Um, uh, analytically distinct means not the same. On uh, the tougher question, uh, in my view, uh, what's the distinctive character of racial injustice? I would need to uh, think more about that, but my um, um, immediate answer is uh, that uh, I do think that uh, more than uh, most identities, um, uh, racial identities, uh, have been uh, politically crafted um, and constituted and politically uh, through direct governmental uh, measures and uh, also a variety of indirect public measures, and uh, they have been constituted as um, uh, systems of inequality, as power hierarchies. Um, and uh, in my mind, uh, that um, uh, fundamentally political character of the creation of these um, uh, identities as unequal uh, and stigmatized statuses, um, that creates greater political responsibility uh, for moving toward um, uh, more genuine civic problems. I respond to this one. Um, just on the first uh, question about um, analytical distinctiveness, um, so I meant by that merely um, to indicate that one can um, make conceptual distinctions that don't track real phenomena, in that I was using the picture to in a, in a purely conceptual way and in a, only a very tentative way, not one that I would be committed to, to distinguish between social and political. Whereas, in fact, I don't think such a distinction um, does describe realities. So that even if I was just referring to my picture again, of all of the stuff that might flow through the expressive discourse, discourse loop could go through the, the structural decision-making loop another time. So for me, socio-political is what our world of associations is, and our associations are of all kinds, the smallest to the biggest of the formally political ones. And so so um, I meant to be able to learn things about different features of a phenomenon by drawing conceptual distinctions, which may not in fact represent any material, real distinction. Okay. Um, I Thank you very much. Um, I guess I have a question for each of you that are sort of related. Your, recent, your last comments, though, suggested that my question is probably out of place because you do want to emphasize the uh, social, socio-political aspect, even of association, because it seemed as though you were, uh, in a way, pinning some of the blame on a right to freedom of association as a political right. But, of course, those rights also come, to some degree, out of and emerge from our social relations over time. And it didn't come from nowhere. And so I'm just wondering if you could kind of refine your analysis of the respect in which freedom of association as a social set of relations, historically, or as a right, or both in some way, what's the relation there? And just apropos of that, this little black box at the end here, kind of um, the one at the end, uh, the 
All right, like influence, expression, branching valve, that seems a little mechanistic there. I mean, what kind of account would one give as to when it goes up and when it goes down? And, you know, that is like an interesting place of interrelation that I think would need some articulation. But just sort of the same question to Rogers, I guess framing it in your terms, who are the gardeners? I mean, there's not just one gardener, right? There are multiple gardeners, and who are they in a way? Um, also, where is the garden? But that's, we won't get into that. But just who, who are they? Who are the gardeners? Well, just who are they? And who, I mean, the element of agency in your account, and again, whether this is, you called it political contestation, but as a social philosopher primarily and social theorist, I would sort of wonder um, what you mean by political agents. Is there a sense in which you would accept, uh, you know, regard it as more of a social relational kind of notion of who's acting and what kind of exploitative and oppressive relations may actually exist among them, such that they would uh, have um, agency in the process. I mean, you do talk about claiming rights, uh, so I think that's a very important part of the evolution of rights, and also that those rights emerge in various ways from our relations. But So that element of your account also I wasn't too clear about. So thank you very much. Um, those are great questions. Um, so the first, um, about associations, I, I wasn't meaning to, in some sense, pin the blame on associational activity, um, rather to point to um, the question of associational life um, as a fundamental one for thinking about democracy and diversity. And beyond that, I didn't say what I would say with Rogers, but I take this to be one of the most important topics for thinking about citizenship in the 21st century. And um, the way I frame thinking about that for myself, um, it goes roughly like this, if you don't mind a little uh, actual but So uh, Tocqueville, um, you know, in the 19th century said about Americans that um, they had perfected the science and art of association. And uh, he was wrong, <laughs> right? Okay, and we figured that out in the 20th century. Um, so two things, you know, so what's the science, what's the art part? The science is a set of theoretical concepts that go into understanding associationalism. The art is the practices that go into enacting it. Um, when he introduced those terms, science and art association, he meant to distinguish democratic life from aristocratic life, as you know, um, so just for everybody else. But um, so where aristocratic, life, uh, aristocrats make things happen by using their capital and giving orders, whereas Democrats have to build collaborative relations in order to make anything of substance of magnitude happen. At any rate, um, 20th century, we figured out that we hadn't completely gotten either the science or the art of association. One good way of understanding how the science has evolved is the prominence of the class of social capital has acquired. That is a theoretical advance in effect in the science of association. I would argue that that we have not yet figured out the art that reflects what we now know about associations. The thing that we know being that um, associational life leads to, it produces forms of power that are convertible into political and economic power. And if we don't figure out how to distribute that kind of social power in an egalitarian fashion, then doesn't do you that much good to do your egalitarian work in political and economic domains. Yet, trying to figure out how to be egalitarian in our associational life touches this problem of associational freedom as we're at its heart. Um, and so, as I say, that's what we are now having to learn to negotiate. I think it's a doable thing. Um, so in that regard, you know, it sort of join Rogers um, in thinking that none of the previous ways in which associational life and political life were put together are necessary. Um, you know, so I do think that there is something to be achieved here um, for the democratic project. Oh, right, the branching valve. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, it is, it is very mechanistic. I, I completely, you know, can see that point. <coughs> Um, whether that stays as the name is a really open question, though, I mean, you'll have heard in my language that one of the things I was doing with this model was taking the metaphor flow seriously. Uh, there's a lot of reason to do that, but I won't spend every time on that now. 
um, what is in this box. Um, there is work being done on that question, but so for instance, some things are obvious. So when expressions are attached to economic power, but then by attention share, right, that affects which direction makes us sort of lobbyists and campaign finance and so forth. But there are also lots of psychological structures. So people who have been doing work on viral, uh, sort of things that, that go viral and have an influence have pinpointed the idea of an ask. Uh, so that when there are petitions to they that ask something of somebody, that ask is that kind of, originally I think it was a switching station moment, um, but you anyway, know, sort of branching kind of moment. And it, so there's a lot that needs to be specified in that space, but it's that kind of thing. Uh, my answer to who are the gardeners will not be entirely uh, congenial to you, uh, Carolyn, that I think of them uh, as uh, first and foremost um, uh, political elites, American revolutionaries, leaders of parties, leaders of social movements, leaders of advocacy groups, um, uh, uh, governing officials of various sorts. Um, and I think that uh, uh, by um, uh, pushing for governmental institutions uh, to adopt laws and policies um, uh, structuring um, uh, the boundaries of um, uh, municipal social behavior, structuring economic relations, structuring um, uh, a variety of dimensions of our life, including uh, our demographic designations, um, uh, they are uh, uh, doing uh, a great deal to um, uh, structure uh, the uh, array of rights and uh, the conceptions of um, uh, racial identity that we have in practice, to use the examples uh, uh, in paper. Um, now, it's also um, uh, true, however, that um, uh, political elites um, uh, can only get and attain uh, power um, if they are um, uh, articulating and responding to senses of identity and interest and value that people have, and they are not solely responsible for the formation of those senses of identity, interest, and uh, value as um, Daniel, Daniel was uh, noting, and um, uh, it is true that there can be um, uh, a lot of developments um, outside uh, political and governmental elite circles, even outside social movement uh, uh, circles, uh, that can uh, reshape senses of affili affiliation, interest, and value um, in ways that may have political consequences, but I'm still a um, uh, political scientist and not a social theorist because um, until uh, those reformulations of, of uh, identity and value um, are uh, uh, successfully manifested in ways uh, that change the um, uh, actual practices in the society, which means inevitably changing the governing institutions and policies to some degree, uh, then I don't think much change has occurred. So I don't think that you can produce substantial change without sooner or later um, going through the route of these uh, political uh, elites and governing institutions. Um, and so uh, uh, the, um, uh, you can't uh, uh, avoid sooner or later uh, trying to um, capture the gardeners for your cause. Thank you, um, Rogers. Um, I have some problem with political bargains and choices. It seems to me, on the one hand, a given, um, and perhaps too large an umbrella. Um, I wonder how it applies to the cliche that one can't legislate the reversal of discrimination. So that brings us back to the psychological and the social. Um, and I wonder, on the other hand, when I accept it, if of course it isn't in the service of, in particular, e economics, um, and I'm thinking, well, of economics as well as the social and the psychological. And so I wanted to say all that as a preface to asking you whether you feel that your conclusion applies equally to all of the racial groups, 
um, which have faced racism in this country. You gave only the briefest mention of Native Americans, but uh, certainly in addition to African Americans and Native Americans and Asian Americans, I think um, we have distinct histories, distinct economic questions, and distinct social psychological. So, um, so um, I certainly think you can legislate discrimination. Um, no, I see. I know. Anti. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, and you're saying, well, but the cliche says that you can't uh, uh, legislate the reversal of discrimination. Um, I would, uh, you know, in my argument, um, uh, conceptions of racial identity that um, uh, foster discrimination are um, uh, historically extensively products of uh, legislation and public policies that labeled and um, legally empowered various kinds of discrimination. And I think that um, is the single biggest factor in fostering senses that there are such things as racial identities. And you can't discriminate on the basis of race if you don't think there are such things as racial identities. Um, and uh, so uh, I do think, going back to the answer to John, that these are um, uh, pretty extensively politically uh, constructed uh, identities, um, the kind of racial identities we have in uh, America. Uh, and I think that once um, uh, constructed, um, because they um, become part of people's sense of identity and interest uh, and their values, they are very hard to um, uh, modify. But I do think uh, that it is um, not only possible, it's necessary first to dismantle the political structuring that fostered um, senses of uh, racial identity as a, a structure of inequality in the first place, um, and uh, uh, secondly, uh, to uh, try to um, uh, address those um, uh, systems of uh, material inequality uh, that were to a large extent uh, uh, publicly constructed and uh, pretty pervasively publicly sanctioned and approved uh, in terms of private discriminatory behavior. Um, I think it uh, will take a lot of time before those public policies uh, lead to um, uh, an eradication of uh, the um, senses of interest and value that have been expressed in racial uh, discrimination. But I don't think we can move in that direction without them. So uh, I'm not simply saying you can legislate reverse discrimination, but you do need legislation to move us toward um, uh, a situation in which racial discrimination um, is less, uh, less deeply uh, entrenched uh, practice. Um, uh, in regard to um, uh, their distinct racial groups with distinct histories and uh, distinct economic positions, um, uh, etc., um, uh, I agree, but I also think there's a danger in overemphasizing how distinct they are. Um, I think that the uh, uh, structuring of racial and ethnic identities um, uh, in American history uh, has been an intertwined and interwoven one that um, uh, the, um, uh, the arguments used uh, to create certain sorts of uh, tutelary education for African Americans in the late 19th century uh, were adapted to um, uh, for the kinds of uh, vocational schooling being provided uh, Native Americans. Uh, I think it's also true that uh, as groups, um, Asian Americans, Latinos, uh, have uh, come into this country, uh, they have encountered um, a uh, racial template uh, structured with whites at the top and blacks at the bottom, and uh, that uh, their uh, choices and identities have been constrained by that structure, perceptions of them have been constrained by that structure uh, in ways where they um, had to make decisions, and others have pushed them to make decisions about how much they will ally with established systems of white privilege, how much they will ally uh, with forces of resistance, and uh, how much, um, in the case of Asians, the model, the model minority image, they'll be uh, allow themselves to be um, will resist being used to justify certain kinds of racial inequality, 
so it's true, there are distinct identities and experiences here, but they're distinct identities and experiences uh, within uh, a common political system and uh, culture, and I think we have to understand the interrelationships um, and not simply uh, say, oh, you know, being Asian American has nothing to do with being black American, has nothing to do with being a Latino American. That's not the uh, uh, historical experience, and it works against, I think, an understanding of the complex um, processes of uh, construction of um, uh, racial and ethnic identities and uh, statuses in this country. Uh, this is maybe for Roger to know uh, maybe uh, uh, you might have something to say about it. The question I have uh, is to what extent do you think your critique of the folks uh, who think there is a closer connection, whether conceptual, psychological, uh, analytic, uh, between the democratic tradition or the rights tradition and uh, the discriminatory traditions like racism, to what extent do you think the difference here is really uh, methodological? Uh, or the particular conception of uh, the account, the sort of account you are giving and they are giving, that they might include people like me. Uh, <clears throat> Here's what motivates the question. If you take, to go far afield, uh, something like Nietzsche's claim that links, analytically links Christianity, indeed, doctrines about the Trinity with resentment. Now it seems to me, for, for Nietzsche, that's an analytical truth. I cannot imagine you, probably both of you, ever thinking, look, this, this could not be analytical. What you have here is a kind of abridgment of a complex history of contestation, of political action, of groups coming together, etc., etc., and maybe you have a story that links, or maybe uh, notions about uh, the Trinity with with uh, with guilt, uh, with resentment. Now, but for, for for Nietzsche, that's an analytical truth. Okay, for you, it would not be. Similarly. Coming back to the sort story you're telling, uh, those who are offering a conceptually closer account, linking liberalism with uh, racism, let's say, it seems to me are doing a different kind of political theory. It's not a political theory which it seems to me is conspicuous in the kind of work both of you are actually doing, which is a certain kind of, uh, uh, a kind of, uh, and I don't mean this pejoratively, in fact, I mean this as a, as a kind of commendation. It's a kind of political pragmatics. You're trying to figure out, in some sense, a, a particular kind of um, action plan. Uh, and I think my own sense is that's in some sense what motivates the sort of objection you have to those who see a closer conceptual link. That the other folks are just doing something different uh, than the sort of thing you are looking for. Well, um uh, if they are, I, I really don't understand what the difference is. Um, and, uh, but, you know, uh, I have never understood uh, why um, uh, they, uh, and the they includes you, uh, see uh, the arguments being advanced 
as different from the argument that I'm making. Um, I, there is this claim that there's a perception of a closer link than I'm uh, uh, seeing, but when the claim is cashed out, it's that, um, uh, well, um, liberal rock doctrines of uh, rights um, are, um, uh, don't provide full sociological accounts, um, they seem to threaten existing social structures, um, uh, that creates um, uh, efforts to limit them, um, uh, but my account says all that too. I don't, I don't have any difference with that. Um, uh, I didn't, you know, I do think that the claim of that that means um, that this is a fundamentally liberal culture, but the liberal culture is responsible for uh, the racial inequalities, um, uh, that doesn't work because on the terms of this account, the systems of racial inequality were conventional before the threat of the rights arises. Um, uh, but uh, the notion, uh, the doctrines of rights, um, uh, create uh, uh, pressures for um, greater uh, elaboration of a social structure and challenge many existing social structures um, is something I think I've always endorsed and I've been informed by your work uh, amongst others uh, to make that argument. So I don't really see uh, this difference. I also uh, I don't agree with the account of Nietzsche. I don't, uh, uh, as I read the genealogy of morals, uh, the account is, um, you know, um, uh, the Romans um, conquered the Jews, uh, uh, Jewish priests don't like it, um, uh, they elaborate a doctrine that um, valorizes the weak, and um, uh, castigates uh, the powerful, and that's Christianity. Uh, but uh, is that distinct, and does that mean they're analytically linked? Um, uh, to me, it's uh, the political inequality provides the motivation, the motivation, uh, psychological and political motivation, for elaborating a doctrine that valorizes yourself. And I see that as a psychological and political link more than one of logic, which is what I think analytic suggests. So um, if you say, no, that's um, uh, an analytical uh, connection, um, uh, I don't know if it's a methodological difference, it's just I don't understand how you're using the term. So <clears throat> that's a great question and some of the comments. Um, I think. In my case, um, the picture's a bit different um, from Roger's case. So I am closer to the folks who draw a tight connection um, through the first half of the story, by which I mean um, I agree and I have made, sort of made arguments that as a political form, democracy is psychologically demanding in distinctive ways. Um, during the, argument that it made is that um, you sort of it, it, it tells everybody, it tells all of us that we are agents in the most powerful way, sort of whom we are the people we are supposed to make this thing, and then yet which of us actually ever feels empowered in that kind of way, and that produces needs to resolve a certain kind of psychological tension. And um, psychological. Sorry? Psychological. Right, yes, no, right. Sorry. So, so, right, so my point is, but. So the, that's the first part. So I say there's an analysis of democracy that I agree with. That is to say that it, it generates certain kinds of problems. But see, I agree with that. But then where I part right is in thinking that there's a variety of possible solutions to that problem, and that the solutions that have been, you know, that have wound up in place over the course of the last 200 years aren't necessary, and are the product of social contestation. But I, I really don't, I don't see the point is, I mean, what would constitute something being necessary? If, if there was just no way around that being the solution, that is to say, you know, no matter what you tried to uh, generate different social practices to deal with, to respond to these tensions, um, you would, you fell back in the same old thing over and over again. So, I mean, there's some evidence for that in the sense that, you know, for 200 years, you've been falling back into the same thing. On the other hand, I mean, this is where for me, um, you know, having, I, I don't think that as a, as a polity, 
uh, we have actually fully formulated, I, th I think we have newly formulated some, in intellectual terms some of the features of the work of dealing with tensions that arise from democracy itself. Psychological tensions being one, these associational tensions being another. So, for, so that's the sense which I meant. We actually made some scientific advances, I would argue. But and and to me, that opens up a question about new solutions set as possible. But Ude is insisting on a conceptual analytic linkage, and you've just given an argument, which I fully agree with, uh, on a psychological consequence of embracing uh, democracy, um, and which is exactly the sort of argument that I think I've made. I think it's really the argument that you made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and, but, so, I don't really see what the difference is. You know, you say, well, you're closer to what Ude is saying, but it all seems the same to me. Well, on that note, why don't we all, how do you all join us? <laughs> <laughs>